Kenny Chesney had a song, yeah, you know, it uh, started out, he said, uh, turned on the evening news, saw an old man being interviewed, he just turned 102, asked him what was the secret of life, he looked up from his pipe and smiled and said, don't blink, life goes by faster than you think, don't blink. People uh, would tell me when I became a parent that uh, don't blink before you turn around, they'll be graduating high school. And uh, it's, it's been pretty close to accurate, right? Things uh, go very fast. It's, it's amazing to, to think about how quickly um, time flies and how much and things change. And now Joseph, our youngest, he's uh, eight months old and he's like making sounds and trying to start beginning this make sounds of talking, and I remember when our oldest, Matthew, did that, and so it's kind of like, wow, has this much time um, gone by? And uh, here we are about to enter into a new year, are we in a new year, 2020, entering that year, and um, it seems like we were just starting the last year. It seemed like it was just like we were beginning 2019. It, it just goes by so fast, and the days don't go faster but I think that it seems like they do because like every day you, you have the same, when you get into a routine and things are, seem like they're not really changing and then all of a sudden like we come face to face with the reality of how much things are changing and that scares us a little bit. Change is always a little scary because we're not sure what change might bring. We don't know what changes might come in 2020, what's around the corner and When 2020 comes to an end, don't blink, and it'll be 2021, what will 2020 have looked like for you? Will you have taken advantages of the unique opportunities that were given to you this year? Will this have been a better year before you than last year? Will you have spent more meaningful moments in 2020 than you did in 2019? There's no guarantee of that. For me, um, one of my, I think, greatest flaws biggest hang-ups, uh, character flaws, I think it's a character flaw, I, I do, is that, um, is that I'm always trying to get to the next thing. Like I'm always looking at what's just around the horizon, just around the corner. I can't wait for that thing to get here. Um, and as a result of that, like I think sometimes I'm not always attentive to where I am now or not this thing or what I'm doing now or, or maybe not giving attention or taking for granted the gift that is the present moment. I know there's some things that, like, I'm looking, I can't wait to get in the rearview mirror. I can't wait for this to be over. I can't wait to get to the next thing, the next season, because, you know, it's just going to be so great. It's going to be so great when this is in my rearview mirror. For me, um, I'm looking toward 2020. There's a big meeting in the United Methodist Church in May and called General Conference, and I can't wait for that to be in my rearview mirror, okay? I can't wait for that to be in... Uh, our church's rearview mirror, okay, so that we're past that. Maybe for you, maybe it's something like a graduation. You can't wait for that graduation to be here, be done with school or for your child's school or whatever that it is, stop paying college bills, okay? Maybe it's a wedding that you can't wait to be in your rearview mirror. Maybe it's some health test or surgery or procedure that you have to have that you can't wait for being here. Maybe it's some trip that um, you've got planned that you can't wait or you have to take that you can't wait to be Done with. Maybe it's not necessarily something bad. Maybe it's something good that you can't wait to be done with. You can't wait to have that in your rearview mirror. But the problem of living that way, the problem of always having your eyes on the next place, on the next thing, is that you miss this place. You miss this thing. You will never be in your next place. You will only be in this place. And if your eyes are only on what's ahead or getting the next thing in your rearview mirror, getting from one place to the next to the next, you miss life because life is the journey. If you can't wait, if you're single, and you hate being single, and you just can't, you feel like like you just stand out and you're different and weird, and you just can't wait to be attached to somebody, or you just can't wait to be married, Life is going to be so much better when I get to that place. Maybe that's what you're thinking. Or if you're married and you think, wow, I just just can't wait till we have kids or I wish we could have kids or 
or, or, or if you do have kids, I can't wait till I don't have kids, you know, until, I, until they're grown, and then I have a life again, and can do what I want again. Or if they're grown, you're like, I can't wait till I have grandkids again and relive this whole cycle. And what happens is that people live that way. People live where they're always looking back at, either they're looking forward and just can't wait to be out of this season into the next season, or they're always looking back at how wonderful it was. How wonderful it was when I was single and free and I had the thrill of the romantic chase. How wonderful it was when my kids were young and they were all cute and cuddly and not mean to me like they are now. Or how, how wonderful it was before I had to pay college bills. Or how wonderful it was when I was young and I felt strong and healthy or whatever. We, we, we live that way and we miss the gift of this moment. This is a gift, this moment. If you spend your life looking back, looking forward, you miss the gift that is the present. That's why they call it the present. I've heard that in so many high school graduation speeches. And, uh, and it's true. And this mindset of always having to get to the next thing, if you're like me, okay, you have this hang up too, it contributes to probably the greatest threat to the gift of the present moment. And that is hurry. Your life defined by hurry. You're so busy. Hurry is a great thief. It will steal from you. And it will steal something from you that you can never get back. Because it robs us of the gift of the present moment. We can't be present where we are because we're so looking forward to the next place. I can't be attentive and listen to the person who's in front of me, who's talking to me and trying to communicate with me in this precious moment because I'm thinking about somebody else that I want to talk to or something else that I need to do or something so, somewhere else that I'd rather be. Hurry. It robs us of the gift of the present moment. And the thing about it is that the day and time in which we live, we have more technological conveniences than ever. Like 50, 60 years ago, this is for real. People thought in like the 30s, 40s, 50s, I think even the 50s, they thought that like within a few years, a few decades, people would, ha people would have like 20-hour work weeks. Because we would have so many conveniences, we would be able to save so much time. Things like washing machines, dryers, dishwashers, all that time that you spent before on all these household chores, cooking food, microwaves. I mean, my goodness, how much free time everyone's going to have. It's going to be great. People will work less in the future. But what's the reality? Is that we work more. We have more time savers. But we waste time more than ever. And as a result is that we have this increasing loneliness and anxiety. And we like feel like life is kind of flying by. And I'm spending all of it looking at a cell phone. And I'm not being attentive. And I feel lonelier. And I feel more isolated and not present to those around me. And not present to the to the one who created me, he feels further away than ever before. I don't feel close to him. I don't hear him speaking his voice to me. It feels like he's absent. Maybe it's because you're so much in a hurry. It's because you're never in a present moment. Dallas Willard taught philosophy at USC. is also the author of uh, several books on Christian discipleship. He says that hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life in our day. The great enemy. And it's, it's, interesting, it's an interesting comment. There's so many things that could be an enemy of the spiritual life. You know, I think about greed, I think about lust, and you, know, you think about all of those different things, all those different great sins, gluttony, whatever, all those seven deadly sins. Dallas Willard says it's hurry. Hurry is the great enemy. And the thing about busyness, and being in a hurry is that it just makes us feel so important. I'm so busy. I'm such a hurry. I got so many things to do. It makes us feel alive. It makes us feel godlike. Because 
when we're active, when we're doing something, we're being the most like God. We are in charge. And what happens is our activity can give us the illusion of our sovereignty. It gives us the illusion that we are sovereign, that we're in charge. As long as I'm busy, I'm doing something, I'm making a difference, I'm exerting my gifts and authority to accomplish something. It makes us feel alive. It's wonderful. I'm standing up here, I'm telling you, I'm the world's worst at this. Okay? But what happens is, when we never stop, when we're so busy all the time, is what happens is is that activity, not only does it give us the illusion of sovereignty so that we're always active and we don't ever stop and we, we don't have to remind ourselves that we're not in charge and entering into the void that of silence that we just can't stand to bear, is that what happens is that activity becomes an outlet for our anxiety. I stay busy so I don't have to think about all that I'm worried about or everything that I'm scared about or to enter into a reality that where maybe I'm not as important as I thought that I was. It becomes an outlet for our anxiety and in that way it kind of becomes like, like a drug because we we never stop. We're always busy. We're going from one place to another. And we do that to kind of cover up the anxiety that is within us. We, that we can't like enter into this idea of like the quietness and rest that might like remind us that we're not in charge of everything. And, and what happens is we stay busy to remind ourselves of that. So that busyness covers up our anxiety. And so what happens is, is that we get more anxious. We get more and more anxious, and so we have to get even busier to cover up even that even greater anxiety. So it becomes like this cycle that never ends. And so is it any wonder that we're like more anxious than ever? We're anxious about everything. Well, in the midst of all this, God has a word. And I believe this is God's word to you at the beginning of 2020. Stop. Stop. Be still. It was a very anxious time for the people of Judah. That was the tribe of Israel, one of the tribes of Israel. They split into two different kingdoms uh, after King David's grandson, Rehoboam, became king. And the northern tribes were called the kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes, and the southern tribes were the kingdom of Judah. And uh, this was a time that Isaiah the prophet was prophesying. Isaiah prophesied during four kings of Judah. He was from the tribe of Judah. And the time that he was prophesying was a particularly anxious time because the northern kingdom had been wiped out. Israel, the northern tribes, was no more. They had been conquered and carried into exile by a people called the Assyrians. And their capital was in Nineveh, which is in modern-day Iraq. And uh, so this Assyrian juggernaut was out there, and Judah, this little nation with Jerusalem at its capital, they were helpless in the face of this Assyrian power. And so as a result of this, as a result of their anxiety, King Ahaz begins to look for alliances. Who can help us? And he looks of all places to Egypt. Now, Israel had a history with Egypt. They had been slaves there. This was an idolatrous nation. They didn't share the values. It was kind of like trading one villain for another. But when you're in that place and you're facing annihilation, they look for alliances with the Egyptians. And so in the midst of this chaotic, anxious moment, God speaks. And God speaks to the people through the prophet Isaiah, and this is what he says. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. Your salvation isn't in the Egyptians. Your salvation isn't in more power. Whatever it is that's going to give you security that you think that you will 
when I get there, when I arrive at this, then I can have peace and all these other things. Now, what you've always needed has been there, but you wouldn't have it. And so now, verse 16, this is what will happen. They said, you said we will flee on horses, but you will flee. You said we will ride off on swift horses, but let me tell you, you can run away from your problems. You can run away from your fears. They will follow you. Your pursuers will be swift. You can hide. You can run away. You can try to cover it up with activity or put up whatever, whatever facade you want, whatever that thing is that you're covering up. You can run, but you can't hide. It's going to catch you. And here's what it's going to look like. A thousand will flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five, you will all flee away. This was kind of a, in, in, uh, in Deuteronomy, God had said to them, he says, if you do what I say, if you obey my commandments, one of you will chase a thousand. You're going to be invincible. But because repentance and rest, quietness and trust hasn't been your strength, a thousand will flee at the threat of one. In your fear and anxiety, you're going you're gonna to see phantoms. You're going to see things to be afraid of because you put your security in other things, in what you're doing, in what you have. You will be left like a flagstaff on a mountaintop, like a banner on a hill. I just That image is so powerful. It's like there's this lonely flag up there on a mountaintop. It's ragged. The wind has blown. It's solitary. It's all alone, relentless. It's being pounded. That's what you're going to be like. But there's hope. Isaiah ends with a word of hope here. He says that that the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He longs to be gracious to you. And, And not only that, He will be gracious to you. He will rise up to show you compassion for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who What's that word? Oh, we just love that word? No, we don't love that word. Blessed are all who wait for him. I hate waiting. I hate waiting five seconds on my phone. Okay, if it's that long for it to pull up, that's too long. Blessed are all who wait for him. So you see, instead of the illusion that our activity gives us, that we are, the, the that our activity can give us the illusion of sovereignty, God says, cease your activity and remember God's sovereignty. Cease your activity and remember God's sovereignty. Some of you are like, that's a nice idea. (laughs) Yes, fine. Dream on, you know. Dream on, and I understand that. I have three kids, four and under, and so... Like, there is no ceasing activity around my house. There's always something they might choke on. You know, there's always a road. You know, there's just a danger, whatever, around us. Okay, always. And so there's constant vigilance. And that just might be the season that you are in. But chances are everything that you're doing, you don't have to be doing. Everyone that you're trying to please, that you're working so hard to please, you don't have to please them. Everyone that you think you're responsible to or responsible for, um, you're not. You have higher, greater responsibilities. Okay, some of you are really busy doing church things, and you're exempt of all this. No, 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 this is, this is included too, okay? This is included too. We are so busy. And the word, if you don't want to be in a place where 2020 goes by and you look back and you feel regret about it and you feel like there's this this voice, something's missing, stop and remember who's God. Be still and know that I am God. It's interesting, in Psalm 46, there's all these Tumults happening in the world, and the Lord speaks in the midst of all these mountains falling in the sea and ends with this declaration, be still and know that I am God. Stop and remember who's God. 
chances are you don't have to be doing everything that you're doing. Stop and remember. There was one command that God gave to the people of Israel. That was to make them stand out from all the other nations. You are to be holy, is what God said to them. And holy means set apart, different. That's the way we describe God. God is set apart. God is different. And really, all the commands do that. But there was one in particular that was very weird. It was very different. They were all different. But this one was, is unique in that God said that all these other nations around you, they work 24-7. I mean, they might sleep at night, but they go, 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 go. I want you to be different. This is in the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments appear in Exodus chapter 20, and they're kind of rehashed in Exodus chapter 5, or Deuteronomy chapter 5 is a, just an extra reminder. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. We see God says this, and God means it. In fact, in the, well, on the, in the wilderness journey, they had a miraculous provision of food every day. And then God said, on the sixth day, I want you to collect a double portion because you're not going to go out and pick it up on the seventh day. There will be enough on the sixth day. And, of course, they don't trust that. They go out on the seventh day, too, to collect it, and it rots, okay? <clears throat> they have a hard time ceasing from their activity and believing what God has said. But, uh, but what we see like through history is that the people of Israel, they added a lot of extra commandments to the Sabbath day. So about the time Jesus comes along, it has become burdensome. And Jesus was accused of breaking the Sabbath when he healed people. Supposedly, like they, one of the regulations was like if you could wait to the next day to go see the doctor, that you should do that, that you shouldn't be healed. That was therefore a violation of Sabbath to heal someone. And so you see that they had kind of added extra things so it had become burdensome. But it wasn't meant to be that. The Sabbath was meant to be a gift to the people. But as, a, but as a result, they wound up going the opposite direction. They became too legalistic about it. I think probably if, if on, in our day, we do, we're probably negligent of not giving it enough attention at all. But some of us, you look at this and you're like, this is ridiculous. You know, it's impossible to do this, to cease from my activity and remember God's sovereignty. But this is my advice. And so when you say this, I'm not saying it like in some legalistic and for some legalistic way. And for the Jewish people, like Saturday was there. Sabbath day, for me, Sunday can't be a Sabbath day, obviously. I mean, I'm working up here. It doesn't look like work to you, but this is work, okay? But this is what I try to do, okay? And I'm the worst, at, but look, take one day out of seven. I mean, that's my, that's my advice. Take one day out of seven. One day a week. Six days you shall work. On the Sabbath day is to be a day of rest. On it, you shall not do any work. Now, um, some of you work jobs where it's very hard to do that, okay? Like if you own your own business or if you're an accountant and it's tax season, okay, you're like overwhelmed with work, and I understand that. And there may be seasons, and there are seasons, it's the same case in my life. My day is Friday. Sometimes people want to have funerals on Fridays. And a lot of times what happens is that, like, when I work seven days, I get sick. I mean, that's just, if I don't take a day of rest, my body, I will get worn down, and I will get sick. Until I had three little kids, and now, like, I'm sick all the time. But, um, <laughs> and my immunity is, like, rock solid now, I think, what is what it, the way it is. But, like, but, but so if you have seasons like that where you're working seven days a week, I hope you have comp time. I hope you have seasons that you can, like, catch up, Okay. Because not having a day to rest is not the way that God wants you to live. I'm going to be bold enough and say that, okay? That is not the way to live. And I know sometimes we got to work two jobs and we got to stay busy because we have all the essential things in life we have to have. We have to have those three or four cars. We have to have, like, the most up-to-date iPhone, like the iPhone X, and we got to have Hulu and Netflix and and like the Prime, whatever, Amazon Prime, and, and like all my cable channels, and those are like the things that you can't live without. You know, I got to like have a car payment and all that stuff. I understand that. You know, you're working those two extra jobs so that you can live this, ex, this, this, this certain lifestyle that you think you got to keep up with all your neighbors and everything. But is that really what life is all about? You see, the people, all the people around Israel were looking out, they were working all the time to serve their gods. 
And the Lord says, I want you to stop and take a day to worship your God. To worship me. A day for me, it's a day that I don't fill my calendar, okay? It's a day that I don't do anything that I don't, I try not to do anything that I don't have to do. Okay, sometimes I will mow my grass on, on Friday. I do exercise on Friday, which is my day off. Okay, but, but I take it as a day that I'm going to be home and I'm going to spend it with my family. And you know what happens? This is hard for me. Like, I am a grump a lot of times on my day off. I'm irritable. I'm like, I don't, I'm just, because it's like a detox for me. Because I like going and doing and being busy to make myself feel significant. And when I stop, it's like I don't feel significant. It's like, it's like there's my life just feels the world just, just keep going on without me. And there's so many things to do. You know what? Everything that you think can't wait till tomorrow, I bet 75% of it at least can wait till tomorrow. It can wait and you can be attentive to the people in your life and this year that is going to go by like a blink and those people who are changing and may not be with us at the end of the year or the kids who are going to grow up and be gone at the end of the year or or growing up are going to be so different in the end of the year that you can be present in this moment that God has given you. You might say, well, I don't have time to do that. Yeah, you do. You have today. I mean... You got 2020. I don't know how much, how much of it you got, but you got this part. You made it this far. You got 2020. You can pause from your hurry because your frenzy of activity, it won't fill the void in your soul. And that detox that is the Sabbath day, that day to stop and maybe you feel kind of depressed and irritable and down like I should be because you're not having all that activity to cover up your anxiety. It's like it gets you ready for the face of the week. It's like a cleansing to get ready to remember your place in the world. To remember who's God. And so you can sacrifice at the altar of hurry. And it can make you feel powerful. It can make you feel significant. And it can make you feel important. But at the end of 2020, when this year goes by, and it will go by faster than a blink, will you look back, and will you have spent that year with the people who mean the most, giving attention to those who are the closest to you, those who are the most important people in your life, and to your Creator, the one who gave you life, and the one who offers you eternal life, will you have been attentive to them? Or when the year goes by, you'll be left wondering where it went and experiencing regret. We, uh, We have breakfast together as a family, before I go into work, that's one of the blessings of living just 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes from your job. And, and uh, Molly fixes this breakfast, and we get up and get ready for the day. And we sit around our table, and it used to be a day that we could have conversations, like I could actually talk to her, like have a, but now it's like, it's, there's interruptions, talk, there's just, uh, you know, just random things just will come up. And so, uh, so we, we sit, we have breakfast, and, and usually, like, I'm ready to go. I'm, like, ready to get through with this, and I eat, like, my kids take longer to eat and stuff, and so I'm like, I'm done, let's get up, let's go, i got to go to work. And, uh, um, but the other day, like, I was sitting there eating, and I finished my breakfast and was about ready to get up and go. I was a little getting close to time for me to leave, and, and uh, Matthew, my oldest son, he's four, he came over, and he was, I guess, finished with his breakfast, or like, actually, he was only like, halfway done, and he wanted to sit in my lap, and I was like, I was kind of in a hurry. I was like, Matthew, what, are you feeling okay? I mean, what's, what's the matter? What's going on? He said, no, I'm feeling fine. I just love you. And you know, I, I thought, I'll be five minutes late to work. <laughs> because I'm going to stop and I'm going to cherish this moment with my little boy, my son. Because... 
It's going to go by faster than a blink. Verse 